And we're continuing uh, looking at some snapshots uh, from the last week of Jesus' life, looking at God's plans for Easter and what God was doing at that first Easter. So Matthew chapter 21, uh, verses 23 to 46, page 876. When he entered the temple complex, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I'll also ask you one question. If you answer it for me, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Where did John's baptism come from? From heaven or from men? They began to argue among themselves. If we say from heaven, he'll say to us, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we're afraid of the crowd because everyone thought John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. But what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, my son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I don't want to. Yet later he changed his mind and went. Then the man went to the other and said the same thing. I will, sir, he answered. But he didn't go. Which of the two did his father's will? The first, they said. Jesus said to them, I assure you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you didn't believe him. Tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. But you, when you saw it, didn't even change your minds then and believe him. Listen to another parable. There was a man, a landowner, who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, built a watchtower. He leased it to tenant farmers and went away. When the grape harvest came, drew near, he sent his slaves to the farmers to collect his fruit. But the farmers took his slaves, beat one, killed another, stoned a third. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first group. They did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those farmers? He'll completely destroy those terrible men, they told him and lease his vineyard to other farmers who'll give him his produce at the harvest. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This came from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew he was speaking about them. Although they were looking for a way to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, have you ever asked that question? Uh, that was asked there in verse 23. What right do you have? Who made you the boss? Who gave you authority? Where do you get off saying that? You've all heard those phrases, haven't you? Uh, some of us might have even used them, perhaps spoke them, maybe just thought them. Uh, but when they are used, they're usually spoken when someone just seems to get a bit ahead of themselves, don't they? <laughs> and they exercise authority in a way that has no substance and doesn't actually connect with their status in life. I had one of those moments as a teenager at Maroubra. I used to love surfing at Maroubra. Uh, we lived up on the headland, and I had a telescope on my windowsill, so I would just sit up in bed, look through the telescope, yep, time to get up, go for a surf. One glorious Saturday afternoon, I'm surfing at Maroubra. Uh, up the north end, and I, I caught this wave. Uh, it was a terrific wave. I was paddling back out. One of the local bra boys, the surf gang, caught another wave, and it was a corker, and he absolutely mucked it up, and I just smiled as I paddled over the wave past him. 
they paddled out and encircled me. 14 adults around this young teenage boy and said, get out of the surf or we'll bash you. Now, probably I did get out of the surf because I was a wise young man beyond my years at that age. (laughs) But as I wandered down the beach, I legitimately asked that question. What right do you have to order me out of the surf? I didn't have anything to back up the question. But we ask that question, don't we? Sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly. Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey. As we learned last week, he's not hiding who he is anymore, is he? I'm the king promised by God. The symbolism is important, isn't it? Because he doesn't come with arrogance. He doesn't come with pride. He comes with a very humble aim to be rejected, killed, and rise from the dead. He's come to establish the kingdom that God promised, a kingdom where the king dies for the enemies. And as he enters into Jerusalem, he cleans out the house, doesn't he? He cleans out God's house. He welcomes in the unlovely, the broken, the rejected, the blind and the lame, and he makes them whole. He welcomes the children into the gathering and encourages them to sing. And he rebukes the religious leaders. And what do they say? Where do you get off? What right do you have? It's not just a question that God's people ask then. As we work through the passage, we'll see that often the interaction is in the present tense. It's a question confronted amongst God's people now. And today we're going to be encouraged by God's goodness in giving this kind of king authority. But I hope, if you're like me, you'll be rebuked to listen to faithful obedience to the king who certainly does have the authority. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. It's terrific to be able to read it from an outsider's perspective as Matthew, the Jewish tax collector, pens these words. He he was there. He'd experienced the warm welcome of the king of the universe saying, come and follow me, Matthew. Uh, He'd experienced the transformation that came from being connected to the king of the universe who dies for his enemies. Our Father, uh, Matthew is a living example of what Jesus says here at the end of that first parable. The tax collectors are going in. Our Father, as we listen to what Jesus says as he sits in his house, the symbol of his presence with his people, uh, please encourage us with your goodness and please rebuke us as we look at faithful obedience together. Amen. At point two on the outline, uh, Jesus, uh, you'll notice from verse 17, uh, has spent the night outside Jerusalem. Uh, He's gone over to Bethany. It's uh, a little over three kilometres from the temple complex. Really easy to get home. It's all downhill, really hard to get back up in the morning because it's all uphill. Uh, He comes back on the second day and he walks to the temple very early in the morning, we're told in verse 18. Verse 23, when he entered the temple complex, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Uh, Yesterday, Jesus cleared the temple. Today, he comes to sit in his house. Uh, If you'd notice very carefully in verse 13, You'll notice how he describes the temple. Did you see that? It's my house. He may have a very bold claim there, isn't he? You think it's God's house as my house. You can see the equal sign, can't you? (laughs) This is my house. So he gets up early on the second day and goes to sit in his house. Does what any normal king would do. And as he sits in that symbol of his kingdom, he teaches and the pretenders come to challenge him. What right do you have? Who gave you authority? What authority stands behind you? Now, that that word authority is a really important question. For right throughout Jesus' ministry, it's actually at the centre of all that he does. It starts way back at his baptism when God says, that's my boy and quotes Psalm 2 to the people. Uh, And then God takes him out in the desert so that the devil can test his authority. So the people see that this man actually has the goods. Uh, When the devil tempts him and God tests him both at the same time, his authority is proven, isn't it? 
Uh, this is who stands behind me. This is who I'm on about. Uh, the reaction of the crowds at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. No one teaches with authority. Same word, like this man. And then right throughout his life, he interacts with that centurion who's got the sick person in his house. I know what authority you have, Jesus. And then he deals with the man who's a high-rise apartment block for demons. And they recognize his authority. Then he calms the storm and creation recognizes his authority. And then when he has his, his first fight publicly with the religious leaders, when he says, I've got the authority to forgive sins. Only God's got that authority. That question of authority is right at the heart of who Jesus is and what he's doing. So it's no mistake that it's the issue here as the king comes and sits in his house. I'm the bloke who's going to run the universe. <laughs> I'm the one promised by God to bind up a broken creation. What right do you have? And he's exercised it the day before, hasn't he? You remember that? As he's come in and cleared it out, opened up that 25 acres for the world, as he's healed the lame and the blind and welcomed them in, as, as he said, oh, it's okay for the kids to make a noise, to praise God. So Jesus responds to this question with a question of his own. I've always wanted to do this. I'm just not smart enough. Jesus answered them. I'll also ask you one question. If you answer it for me, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. Where did John's baptism come from? From heaven or from men? It's a corker, isn't it? <laughs> and we get their deliberation. Don't, did you notice that there? Uh, we're shown inside their minds. Uh, who are the religious leaders worried about? Themselves, aren't they? They've got knowledge. Don't deny them that. They know the stakes and the significance, but because of their pride and selfishness and their desire to be God instead of God, they ignore the evidence. On the one hand, if we say it's from God, we're snookered because we just rejected God's prophet. On the other hand, if we say it's from men, then the great unwashed mass of humanity gathered around us is going to string us up because they've recognised something we don't want to recognise. Jesus' question also implies that he knows where he stands. You know, John, you know how there was a bloke who looked like a prophet, smelt like a prophet, talked like a prophet, walked like a prophet after 400 years of silence? Me and him are on the same page. Me and him come from the same bloke. Me and him are here by God. It's God's work. And then Jesus just exercises his authority as a king, doesn't he, there in verse 27? well, I'm just going to exercise my authority and just ignore you guys. If you're not willing to look at the facts, if you're not willing to deal with the truth that you know, I'm going to have nothing to do with your questions. And that's a king in his palace, isn't it? That's a king seated on his throne. That's a king who's confronting the rebellious citizens of God's people who've gone, we don't want you to be king, we'd much rather do it ourselves. We don't want you to be king because our authority goes better. Uh, we're going to say yes to God, but our hearts are going to be elsewhere. You see, these religious leaders were very good at mouthing sweet nothings, weren't they? And yet their hearts were far from God. They dipped their lids to God but rejected the authority of God's king. And Jesus then tells them two parables, doesn't he? Notice there's no break. There's no change in audience here. Uh, in verse 28, he then goes, but what do you think? And then verse 33, it's actually command in verse 33, listen. And the two parables are so incisive. Uh, look how he goes on there in verses 28 to 31. Uh, I'm point three on the outline. What, what do you think? But what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, my son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I don't want to. Yet later he changed his mind and went. Then the man went to the other and said the same thing. I will, sir, he answered, but he didn't go. Which of those two did his father's will? <laughs> 
Very simple parable, isn't it? Father, vineyard, two sons. Son one, go and work in the vineyard. It's a command. No, then changes his mind, goes to work. The second, notice that's how politeful and respectful the second boy is. He actually whacks a sir in there, doesn't he? And then he doesn't do it. And then Jesus asks the kicker, doesn't he? Which of the two did his father's will? The answer and then Jesus' response are both in the present tense. Which of the two did his father's will? The first, they say. Jesus says to them, I assure you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness. You didn't believe him. Tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him, but you, when you saw it, didn't even change your minds then and believe him. It's blunt, isn't it? It is so offensive to those who have the veneer of religious correctness, superiority, politeness, those who know how to play the religious game, tax collectors and prostitutes, the outsiders, those who are below the moral standards of the upright and socially acceptable, the dull bludgers, the welfare orders, those who sleep around, get drunk and carry on, those with different skin colour, they're entering the kingdom of God before you. God's just done exactly as he promised, hasn't he? He's opened the kingdom to the outsider. And as the outsider has seen, they have believed. They have turned around and their no has become a joyful yes and they've been welcomed in. The logic's very clear in verse 32. Just look at verse 32. God sent John to call people back to God, to know their rebellion, to repent, to turn away from trying to be God instead of God, to recognise their need for God, to live with God in charge of their lives. Those who have been living life ignoring God had seen John, had heard John, had believed John had responded wholeheartedly and completely. They believed and responded in word and deed. The religious leaders, those with the degrees on their walls, those who'd read the right theology, those who could memorise the right words, those whose external image was fine, who knew the jargon, who ticked all the right social and religious boxes, they looked at John and laughed. They said, yes, sir, to God. And their hearts shouted one big, shiny, veneered no. King couldn't be clearer, could he? God's mob is made up, and I've used the word mob there on purpose because it looks like a mob. God's mob is made up of those who said no but saw what God said and came in a yes, who repented, who relied on the king, who believed in the king, who obeyed the king. Anyone else is a yes man with a no heart. Jesus just ploughs on, doesn't he? Verse 33. I'm at point four on the outline. He's got a command here. Listen. Listen to another parable. There was a man, a landowner, who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, built a watchtower. He leased it to tenant farmers and went away. The parable's not complicated. Uh, as we were listening to Penny, though, I hope you noticed there was a little closer to home. There's no distance here, is there? Because Jesus is pretty much quoting Isaiah 5. All the same words, all the same actions, all the same fences and digging and watchtowers. 
This time there's no distance because the sun speaks about a sun. And this time there's no distance because it's not about John and sinners, it's about Jesus and God's people. Jesus and those who've been entrusted with the responsibility of being and leading God's people. There's a landowner. He owns a block. He's devoted to that block. Don't miss his devotion. He lavishes care upon it. He plants a vineyard. Everything that is needed for the vineyard to succeed, he gives. He constructs. He puts in place. He leaves the vineyard in the care, in the trust, in the trust of tenants. The time comes for harvest, for the trusteeship to be seen. Servants are sent. They're beaten and killed. Servants are sent. They're beaten and killed. The son is sent. He's beaten and killed. Because the tenants are in this game for themselves. It's a direct attack on the owner, isn't it? It's a clear case of murder and theft. It's a moment when the trustees are revealed as traitors. Again, Jesus asks that key question, doesn't he? Verse 40, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those farmers? The answer from the religious leaders is in the present tense. He will completely destroy those terrible men, they told him. You almost see them looking down their noses at those terrible men. And lease his vineyard to other farmers who will give to him his produce at the harvest. Jesus responds in the present tense. Jesus says to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. We would agree with the religious leaders, wouldn't we, in verse 41? That's the appropriate response. The response of Jesus is telling. And before we go any further, let let me just make sure we've got this straight. The landowner is God, isn't it? The vineyard is God's people. The tenants are the religious leaders. The servants sent are the prophets and the son is the son, isn't it? Jesus. They have no idea of the hymn book they use every day in the temple, do they, these religious leaders? Because he just quotes from their own hymn book, doesn't he? Psalm 118. (laughs) A moment when the person scorned becomes the person of judgment and salvation. He reveals their future. You're going to kill me. It couldn't be blunter, could it? In, In his own palace, seated on his own throne, you are stubborn and unwilling to listen to the landowner. The son is here in your midst. The very thing you were entrusted with to be God's people will be taken from your hands. Your lips flap, yes, sir. Your hearts thump no, and you'll be brought undone. You do not obey the owner, and so he will expose your hearts. Your murderous desires to have this thing entrusted to you and to not treat it well will be seen. They've already been planning it from Matthew 12. Jesus exposed it in Matthew 16. You are ungrateful tenants who've turned a fruitful vineyard into a selfish thorn bed. You will kill the son. The owner is coming. The irony is, as they kill the son, (laughs) they're going to fall over the son. (laughs) And the son will actually become in his own death the means by which God will give this trust to a whole other nation. He'll actually show the fruit, trust in the king and live like it. Now, there are so many strands going on here, (laughs) so many strands that we, we want to go down, but I want us to just stay focused. Across both these parables, there is this one key truth. Those who believe in the king, Those who see the king, 
and come back to God, who said no but now say yes, who are connected to the king because of the king's mercy and grace, who obey the king, who obey the king, those are God's people. Those are God's people. And I want you to notice the obedience theme across both. Did you notice that? The theme of faithful obedience, of seeing the king, recognising the king, throwing yourself at the king's feet and then obeying the king. (laughs) Do you notice the order? It's faithful obedience. And the final response of the religious leaders before we finish is telling. Look there in verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew he was speaking about them. Although they were looking for a way to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. We know the truth. It's standing right in front of us. We know repentance. We know what the tax collectors and prostitutes have enjoyed, but the image is too important, isn't it? The image is too important. They've learned nothing from what Jesus has said. Well, I'm at the last point on the outline. The king's come. The king's in his court. The king is exercising his authority. The king's authority is questioned, and we see God's Easter plans unfold, don't we? Uh, you'll see there on your outline, here are just four take-homes for us to think about. Uh, you cannot ignore the king's authority. Jesus is finally out and about, isn't he? He's just so obvious and public. At Matthew 16, he was still telling people to be quiet in case people miss you. But now he's ridden in on a donkey. He's cleared the house. He sat down on the throne. I'm here to be rejected, to die and to rise, so that the outsiders, people who are far from God, sinners like you and me, can come in and know God. His authority is so obvious. It is my house. It is my house. And I am the king. That's what he's saying, isn't it? Isn't it marvellous when a king comes and does that? (laughs) And such a king. And not a king who's come in on the finest looking stallion with the shiniest sword, but a king who's come in on a donkey towing a colt with their hillbillies from up north who has said, I've come into my capital to die for my enemies. What a king. Please don't miss the authority of Jesus King. As we work out our response to that king, please don't miss the goodness of the landowner. It's right across both the parables. Did you notice in that first parable, the father accepts the return of the wayward and stubborn first boy? That's a kind father, isn't it? He says to the boy who went, no, nope, don't want to do it, but comes back and says, yeah, yeah, I really do. And the father goes, you're in. In the second parable, have you noticed how lavish the landowner is? <laughs> he just doesn't pay, spare any expense, time, money. He shows caring protection. Do you notice his patience? One group of three servants killed, (laughs) another group of servants killed, and then what would you do? I I wouldn't be sending my boy. But he sends his boy. He knows what these men do. He sends his boy to remind them of their right duty, and the boy gets killed. This isn't a landowner who's a despot or a dictator, is it? This isn't a landowner who's proud and mean and stingy. This is a God who is generous and kind, who continually enters into a world broken by sin, who is deeply gracious and merciful to his enemies, who thumb their nose at him, who is kind, who lavishes his son on rebels. And the rebels kill him. Don't miss the generosity of God. 
the mercy, the kindness, the patience, the love, the grace that he gives through sending his boy to those tenants. How would you respond to such a king? Uh, let me let me be very clear. There is no debt language here, is there? Because you'll never pay that debt. You notice that's very absent from the Bible. There is no language that says God's people respond because they know their debt and want to pay it off. We'll never pay off that debt. Don't even think in that way. God has just gone, it's all yours. I love you. And that's why faithful obedience is so wonderful. It's faithful because it trusts that God gives us us all and we're never going to pay that back. Don't even use that language. It is just given to enemies. And it's responded to by obedience because if this man has come into the vineyard and been killed by the enemies and then risen from the dead, there is no king who matches him. And so that's why it's faithful obedience. It's not opposed to grace. It just emerges out of grace and it's shown in all of life. In every part of existence, it's a community tray. This is what God's mob looks like. Please don't miss that. And finally, there is an alternative and I'll be brief on this. The alternative remains just as present as the present tense in the Bible, doesn't it? Yes, sir, and allowed no in your heart. Do you notice that Jesus isn't talking about anyone except God's people in that? Right throughout the passages? Are people who say, yes, sir, who say Jesus is king, but then have a heart that says no and a bottom that won't budge from the throne. It's to accept what God offers and then to say, thanks, God, I'm just going to keep this for me. Please don't miss that danger, the danger of mouthing yes and living no. God is very clear about what he will do with that isn't he? Let me pray. Our Father, it will be great to meet Jesus face to face. (laughs) That will be a marvellous day. A day when we come and meet the king who will still bear the scars of riding on a donkey, of going to a cross, of walking out of a tomb. Father, thank you that that king has no rival for his authority, not even death. Thank you that that king comes because you are the landowner of immeasurable grace and love. Thank you that that king takes the lives of rebels and turns them from a no to a yes and then brings the faithful obedience that shows his wonder. Father, protect us from mouths that say one thing and hearts that grasp at others. Father, we pray that as we live as your people here, others, so many others, will come to know such a marvellous King. Amen.